What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today we're continuing with our Liturgy 101 series. We're talking about the Psalms or the intro it or sometimes the opening hymn. Stick around. <laughs> That's right, if you've been following along on the Lutheran Liturgy series or this Liturgy 101 series, we're going through the historic liturgy of the church to understand all the little nuances of it. And I'm doing this for one very important reason. When I was a little kid and I was bored in church, as kids are prone to be, I asked, why do we do all this chanting and facing and in, in my church as a child kneeling why are we doing all this well said the boomer we're lutherans we've always done it this way cool so i left went to a contemporary worship church um almost shipwrecked my faith by the absolute absence of anything that had any semblance of substance but i did eventually learn what the parts of the liturgy were, where they came from, how long the church has been doing it, and why the church has been doing it. So I encourage you, if you're new to the channel, to not only go back and watch the introduction and go back and watch uh, the the uh, invocation and confession and absolution one, where we kind of tackled three things at once, because, you know, reasons. Uh, if you, Also, if you're new, definitely hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and share with your friends, like videos, leave comments. You can also find me at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 1517 films. And you can find me on Thursday evenings on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. And that has been a lot of fun because I get to relax a little bit more. I don't necessarily have to be worried about posture or what I'm wearing. And I just get to cut back, crack a beer and talk about theology. And last week's episode was really good. It was on James chapter 2, and whether or not we're justified by works and not by faith alone. So check that one out. Uh, but we're, we're picking up where we left off with this Lutheran liturgy series, this historic liturgy series. And kind of last time I was talking about it, I, I compared it to the road to Emmaus, where Jesus meets these, these uh, disciples that had, you know, hoped that he was the Messiah and how terrible it was that he was crucified and how this kind of sets the pattern. That, that he hears their grumblings, he opens to them the scriptures, he breaks bread with them, and in this breaking of bread, this Eucharist, this giving thanks, he is revealed. And then, filled with joy at the very real presence of Christ, they run to tell everyone else who they have had an encounter with. So the important thing to understand when it comes to historic Christian worship, it's not about what we do. It's not even really about how we do it. It's about who is there. And ultimately, not about how we're doing it. It's about who is there and what is he doing. That's right. Worship is God's service to us. That is what worship is. So we've talked about the invocation beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and making the sign of the Holy Cross as a remembrance of our baptism that we have been marked with that cross of Christ, baptized at his command into that name of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that name again is going to come up when we discuss the intro. Now, I have my handy dandy hymnal here. We're going through Divine Service Setting 1 because when I show video clips from uh, a project that I did at Concordia University, it's Divine Service Setting 1, and I wa went back and watched that, and we didn't do the intro it, actually. We, d we opted in that video for the opening hymn. But let's take a look at what we're looking at here. I'll see if I can get it on the screen. What we're talking about today appears in the hymnal right there. That's it. Just that one line. That's it. Intro it. Psalm. Or entrance hymn. That's what we're talking about. Now, uh, the invocation and confession and absolution, very important. It, God is where his name is. That's why his name is used at the very beginning of the service. In the very real presence of God, the first thing we must do is make confession of sin because we are in the presence of a holy God and we are wretched sinners and we receive from the Lord 
his absolution, that Christ has suffered and died for us on, on, on his account, we are forgiven all of our sins. Then begins the intro. It Now, following that road to Emmaus pattern, this is the opening up of God's word. The intro it, or a psalm, uh, well, and even the intro it is a psalm. It's a section of a psalm. So traditionally what will happen is a, a, a cantor or a pastor even, if there's an assisting minister, uh, will chant out or speak kind of a theme verse from the psalm and then either um, responsively, pastor, cantor, congregation, back and forth, uh, another section of the psalm, he'll repeat that first theme verse from the beginning, and then comes what is called the Gloria Patre. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now, why are we doing this? Well, it follows that pattern. Uh, the intro, it traditionally uh, has given the the people the theme of the day what is the the scripture going to talk about today well it's summarized in this this psalm this this the book of psalms being vitally important to uh god's people israel to the early church uh memorizing the david as it's called um so this is a this is like the church's first hymnal so this is where the early church went for this and it gives the theme so if you're in a confessional church as we're approaching the season of lent you're seeing that these sundays have very weird names uh i don't know them off the top of my head i'm actually not good with latin but you'll see that these sundays if you look them up uh sexagesma and things like that th and all these other um uh, Quasimodo Sunday is another one, not named for the Disney character with the gargoyles, but named for the Latin phrase that begins the intro it. And that also shows us the theme of the service. But there's another reason for the intro it, or for the psalm, or for an opening hymn, which in the video is what we opted. Now, in the video, and it's only a few seconds, so I'm not going to take time to cut away to it, but in the video, after confession and absolution, uh, the pastor, the minister, I announced in this case the opening hymn. And while the congregation was singing the hymn, myself and the assisting minister moved to the altar and then to our seats. That's why we have the intro it. That's why we chant a psalm. Or, or if we haven't started with a hymn before the invocation, now we have our entrance hymn. It is literally to allow time for the pastor to get where he needs to be. And again, movement being deliberate. Not just kind of lollygagging up to the... No, to the altar. This is very deliberate. And what the people are seeing when they're doing this, the pastor going to the altar, bowing before the altar, going to his seat... We are coming into a time and a place where heaven, don't you dare go, shoo. We're going into a time and a place where heaven meets earth. Now, if you want to say earth is ascending to heaven, heaven is coming to earth. I'm probably going to lead towards heaven descending to earth. But God is coming. Christ is coming. Very real, ever actually present with his people. It's not God being present, Christ being present, kind of like how, you know, grandma's there in your memory after she died. No, Christ is really present. And the motion of the pastor moving towards the altar and reverencing the altar by bowing to it is acknowledging that that which is on the altar is where Christ is going to come to us in his body and his blood, his actual body, his actual blood to give to his people for the forgiveness of sins. And we can, there's going to be a part in the liturgy that maybe we can be mindful of at the intro it as the pastor's moving to the altar where we're going to sing with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven where we laud and magnify God's holy name and we sing. We are not just there, us, this one little local congregation. We are with the entire body of Christ on earth. And we are with the entire body of Christ in eternity all at once. We are worshiping with angels and archangels. And the angels being in the presence of that altar in heaven, bowing their faces to the presence of the altar. The angels covering their faces. So... When does the, the pastor goes up, he bows, he genuflects to the altar, does the congregation? They may. 
And this is not, as some um, cradle Lutherans will say, oh, it's Idiophora, you don't have to genuflect. Idiophora is like the fig leaf of the old Adam. Um, it, it's not a word that we should throw around. Genuflecting is Idiophora in that, to the, to the technical, it's not commanded nor forbidden, but it's a really good practice. So, as I explained the intro, it, a verse from the psalm, the psalm itself, the section of the psalm itself, that same verse again. Traditionally, although room for freedom, pastor, congregation, and pastor, pastor, then comes the Gloria Patre. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. This, for that first half of that, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, this is where the congregation may genuflect. They may bow down to the presence of the altar. They may bow in honor and reverence and awe at the name of the Holy God. Now, there's a couple of theories about where this uh, Gloria Patri comes from. Does it come from Christians wanting to separate their use of the Psalms from the Jews? Eh. What it really boils down to is the Arian heresy, which sadly is still alive today. The, the, the heresy that the ancient church faced that brought us the Nicene and Athanasian Creed against the idea that Jesus is not human and divine at the same time. Arius taught that Jesus is not God. And they, it was, um, how did they used to say it? They would say, and it's not technically wrong, but it's not as right. They would say, uh, glory be to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. Well, that's not wrong. But using the baptismal formula, when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the church adopted that language to basically tell the Arians, not you. It's, it's interesting in, in Christian worship historically how very much, mm -mm, not you, Christian worship actually is. Um, a really good example of this, I think, comes from my time as a chaplain's assistant in Iraq, and uh, one of my friends came to the service. This kid is actually legitimately pagan. Like, like I believe Jesus Christ is crucified, risen from the dead, and ascended into heaven to the very core of my being. This kid believed in the Norse gods. Well, he came up for communion, and the pastor denied him the host. He came to me. I denied him the chalice. Mm -mm -mm. This is not for you. This is for God's people. And so Christians kind of see altar fellowship, the Lord's Supper, as kind of the starting point of, of unity within interdenominational relations, whereas Lutherans and the church historically has seen it as, that's the cap, man. No, 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 no. So as you see, when you compare maybe some of the church's most ancient hymns to some of the most popular praise songs, and you look at some of these praise songs, well, any religion can sing these, but only Christians can sing these hymns. So there is an exclusivity to Christian worship that is to exclude out the world. Worship is not like Rick Warren thinks, where we're supposed to change it and tweak it and adapt it so that the world will like it and come. Mm -mm -mm. This is God coming to serve his people as he sees fit, as he has ordained, and his words and promises stand. And this intro it, serving the practical function of getting the pastor where he needs to be without kind of people just sitting there going, all right, time to watch the pastor walk up, also serves to exclude from the worship anyone who does not believe in the Trinity. Now, I if the invocation didn't do it, this certainly is. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as what was in the beginning. This glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, right here, right now. The glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the glory of the Holy Spirit in this place. And forever shall be world without end. Amen. That's the introit, that's the psalm, that's the opening hymn, as you saw in the hymn. No, there's freedom to do whatever.
But this beautiful piece of scripture-based liturgy, whether it be chanted, whether it be chanted responsively, whether it be spoken or spoken responsively, this is the word of the Lord which gives shape to the rest of the service. It gives the focus of what the, the rest of the readings are going to be, what the sermon is going to be, and it gives us into this mind space that heaven and earth are meeting. We are coming into, as the pastor approaches the altar, the presence of God, the very real presence of God. And after the intro, it, the Kyrie, Lord, have mercy. And we're going to talk about how we can go so quickly from confession and absolution to the plea of the church, Kyrie, eleison, Lord, have mercy. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.